Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. How you doing? <laughs> How you doing? What is cracking? It's Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio. Four. The masses. Yeah, man, let's do this. Tonight is Thursday, July 22nd, 2021. 304 days, 204 days, 304, 204 days into the new year. Only 161 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere. A total undisclosed location, people, but it is beautiful. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. Grace Hobbs. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? It's Thursday night. It is Fader Night. Made this announcement earlier this week. Very excited because tonight, Ron Keel is with us. He's going to help me man the phones. That's right. It's open lines all night long. It's your calls, your conversation, UFOs, conspiracy, time travel, rock and roll, the paranormal country supernatural and western lost history pop culture we're gonna do it all tonight with ron and really looking forward to this and you know the deal right this is open lines it's unscripted it's unscreened it's uncensored it is unfiltered all of that certainly applies to ron keel so ron keel is going to be with us very excited um and <clears throat> more on Ron in just a bit. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about Ron here in just a bit. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. The Sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. Hello to everybody on YouTube, KGRA, The Planet, The Bunker Cam. I think we're live on Facebook, too, as well. And, uh, of course, all of the chat rooms are open. Spreaker, KGRA. So come and hang out. The show is always totally interactive all night long. And uh, watching the Fader Knots uh, do their thing on Twitter, in YouTube, and over on Spreaker. It is just so much fun. And uh, let's see. Oh, Race Hobbs. Race Hobbs is in. Hold on a minute. Race Hobbs is in the chat. Race Hobbs is in the chat. Look out. <laughs> All right. Race is hanging out. All right. You can also email throughout the show, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Any questions or comments? Hashtag F2BQ. All right. Let's get to the breaking news. The breaking news. China is the first story up tonight. That's right. China just unveiled the prototype 
of a super fast magnetic levitation train it says is capable of reaching speeds of 373 miles per hour making it the fastest land-based transportation vehicle in the world. The train, self-developed by China and manufactured in the eastern coastal city of Qingdao, hovers above the track with no contact between the train and the rail and is propelled by electromagnets. The concept allows the trains to hit speeds of hundreds of miles per hour as there is no rail friction. Now, here's the deal. Right now, China does have a maglev train, but that one is only like 19 miles long. So it can only reach speeds of, you know, like 200, it's, it, it's slow. It's like 275 miles per hour. Not this one. Nah. They're talking about, uh, I, I forget the distance, but it's, well, it's about 750 miles. It's like between Shanghai and Beijing or something. 750 miles, and it's going to do that in like three hours. <laughs> That's insane to me. That is insane. It floats. Well, now, I watched the video of this today, and it sounds unbelievable at first, but there's a bird in Australia. It's called the Wild Sulfur Crested Cockatoo. And these cockatoos down under have learned how to open residential garbage can lids. That's right. And then they jump in the trash cans and, and loot the leftovers. That's right. And apparently the birds are teaching each other. They are learning this trick from their buddies. One bird in the far-flung neighborhood even invented another lid-opening technique, which quickly spread to other cockatoos in nearby suburbs. That's right. Researchers are checking this out now. Now, these sulfur-crested cockatoos are natives of eastern Australia. They're large-brained, long-lived, and highly social parrots. I've seen the videos. I'm telling you, this is truly nuts. And they just literally, you know, the trash cans, Put it out in front of your house with the lids that flip over, right? And the garbage truck comes up and, right? Those. They jump on the sides of these uh, plastic trash bins, the ones that you use, and they, with their beak, they, they, then they flip the lids open. <laughs> it's crazy to watch. I'm telling you. And, the next apocalypse, right? The next great extinction event. That's who's going to be running the world after us. Well, this also uh, was released today, and it was uh, it was too much, uh, too much to handle. A nine-hour hostage crisis was just diffused in Sweden after Swedish prisoners release guards in exchange for. Wait for it. For pizza. Yesterday, the nine-hour ordeal reportedly began after two inmates doing time for murder at a high-security prison near the town of Ekelstuna managed to force themselves in an area reserved for prison guards. Armed with razor blades, the convicted murderers took two guards, one male and one female, hostage. The prisoners had two demands. First, they wanted all 20 inmates in their prison block to enjoy pizza with kebab toppings. Secondly, they wanted a helicopter so they could escape once the pizza party, pizza party ended. I'm not making this up. The inmates never got their helicopter. But they did get their kebab hand tossed. That's right. Let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today, David Spade. David Spade is 57. William Defoe is 66. I, I was thinking today, what's William Defoe's best movie? I didn't take any notes. I was just, I just went, you know what? Wild at heart. That's right. That's what I went with. And then Danny Glover. Today is 75, and I'm thinking, what was Danny Glover's best film? 
you know, and I know what everybody's going to think and, you know, the old cop buddy move. No, I'm not going there. The Royal Tenenbaums. John Leguizamo today is 57. His best film? I'm going American Ultra. George Clinton today, get ready for this, he is 80. Bobby Sherman is 78. Don Henley is 74. Al DiMiola is 67. And our friend, Reese Ephens today is 54. One of the great singers out there right now who I really enjoy. Rufus Wainwright is 48. Our dead guy's birthday today is Brian Howe. 1953 to 2020, died at the age of 66. Brian was an amazing vocalist. And uh, he's the guy that Ted Nugent recruited to handle vocals for his Penetrator album and front its world tour. And it was during this period, he replaced Paul Rogers as lead vocalist in Bad Company. How great of a singer do you have to be to be the guy that comes in and fills those shoes of Paul Rogers? Well, you got to be great. And Brian was. He was in Bad Company from 1986 to 1994. Brian went on to a successful solo career until his death when he died of a cardiac arrest while en route to a hospital in Florida on May 6th, 2020. He was just 66 years old. On this day in history, 1991, I remember this like it was yesterday, cannibal and serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer is caught after police officers spot Tracy Edwards running down the street in handcuffs. Now, so they go to his apartment, and in that apartment, police found several heads in the refrigerator, <laughs> found two skulls on top of a computer, and a 57-gallon drum containing several bodies decomposing in chemicals in Jeffrey's bedroom. On this day in 1991, I'll never forget that breaking news. I was like, you've got to be, what? Yeah. Fader fact. I told you yesterday I had a fader fact today for Sweden. And here it is. The United States has more millionaires than Sweden has people. And that is your fader fact. All right, tonight, very special guest right here with us, Ron Keel. He's going to help me man the phones. Excited about this? I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, man, Ron Keel is here. And we're going to be doing our normal fader night. That's right, UFOs, conspiracy, time travel, the paranormal, supernatural, lost history, pop culture, music, food. But tonight, we're going to have a serious dose of the rock and roll and country and western fader night is one of the greatest nights in all of talk radio and all of the world it is totally unscripted uncensored unscreened and unfiltered the call in number is 747-228-2051 and uh i've been lining up calls all night so yeah the phone lines are open they started ringing a long time ago all right let me hit this river moon coffee so rivermoonwellness.com <laughs> oh man so uh so i was chatting you know ron keel's on the show tonight and i can't help but be in the rock and roll mood and um i was checking out some music today and we'll get to all of that a little bit later but but I had a, a really, really fun time going through and listening to some stuff today. And some friends out there sent me some stuff. And, you know, I'm listening to, to the rock and roll. And, uh, and then Ron and I are talking. And it got me to thinking. I thought, you know what? The rant tonight. I got to tell a rock and roll story. And, 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 I'm, and I'm sitting here chatting with... Uh, uh, Ron <clears throat> and, and some thoughts popped into my mind. And I said to Ron, I said, Ron, I, I, and now I asked Ron this question earlier. 
He didn't really answer it, but hopefully his it, his 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 mind is bubbling and and he'll think of an answer. But I asked Ron. I said, "Hey, Ron, Ron, back in the day on the Strip, because there were." thousands of bands back then they were just all over the place and the competition was thick it was heavy and wow you know and that period from if you went from like 1982 all the way up to i'm gonna say 89 you know right right there that that seven year period it was an amazing time in the strip it was an amazing time and it was so magical, right? And I was there. Ron was there. But you can't force this stuff to happen. It's an accident. The Sunset Strip, you know, it's it's funny, you know, it's hair bands. Back then, it was always this concern about pay for play and 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 all of that. But, um, uh. It was by accident. A lot of things led the way, but right up until 1978, 79, of course, with Van Halen, you had a, a really big new wave movement that was coming in, and there was a punk thing that was going on, and and you had uh, you know the rock and roll stuff, and and this was all happening at the same time, uh, not only on the Strip but all over Los Angeles. And, uh, I mean, just go watch Valley Girl, right? Um, yeah, just go watch Valley Girl. So, they, you know, there were these different things. But 1982 rolls around. MTV, te- you know, gets a foothold. And and hair bands, if you want to call it that, rock and roll ended up taking over the strip. I didn't get out here until uh, late 1984. Literally at at a peak, but that peak lasted that, that lasted for seven years. And, and, and the bands that came along, we know them now, you know, poison and, and, and of course, keel and guns and roses and the rock city angels. And, and uh, I, I just go on great white and rad, of course, a motley crew. And it, all of this was happening. Now, but the competition and and the atmosphere of the strip was insane but it was fun and you could go to the strip seven nights a week this wasn't friday night this wasn't saturday night you can go to the strip on monday on tuesday and from clark street from the whiskey clark street all the way up to Gil Turner's, the liquor store on Doheny, right? That that two or three block, it was like 10,000 people packed. It was a wide sidewalk. It's eight, 10 people wide, all the way up, all the way back. And you would think if you didn't know what was going on and you're driving in your car and you managed to get up there and see it, you would think there was some big event. No. It was just another night on the Sunset Strip. <clears throat> so, back to my story. All of this stuff is going on. I'm a guitar player, <clears throat> and and I know everybody. Everybody knows me. Everybody knows each other, and all the bands and and stuff. That that was it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, one big happy Aquanet family, but. You start to get into the ebb and flow of these bands, right? Have you heard of so-and-so? Have you heard about this band? Have you seen Circus? Have you seen, you know, right, Hans Naughty? And um, (laughs) Hans Naughty. (laughs) And uh, so anyway, I start to hear about this band, called warrant now i don't know the exact year but i'm thinking it was around 1985 somewhere in there and i go with uh with my friend rob and we go to the troubadour 
and the troubadour is packed and it's packed outside and there's all this commotion going on and we go in and the troubadour which is a happening place it's it's and it's got a unique setup the stage is really close to the back wall you could fit maybe a couple hundred people on the floor but this the stage was like equally as big as is the venue itself and then you had this balcony up on top so you could get probably three or four hundred people in there packed out but it was uh if you got that many people in there it was insane and i saw a lot of bands in there everybody but anyway so i'm there to see this band warren and i walk in and it's packed can't move and uh and and i was by the front door Never, I don't even think I ever really got inside. But anyway, I'm by the, I'm, I'm on that side of the stage, stage left, house right. Warrant comes out, and I'm expecting something. And I'm just here to say, what I saw on that night with that sold out place, the band pretty much sucked. And, and I was trying to understand what was going on, the screaming girls, but the singer, I don't know who he was. I don't, I don't remember his name, but not up to snuff in the band, the songs. It was just like, I don't, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. What does it take to sell out a play? I, 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 I just didn't get it. And I remember the singer had on a, a Levi's jacket with a sheriff's badge on, you know, worn. And and man, I, I I didn't get it. All right. So then, and it must have been, I don't know, again, about the timeline, and I'm probably completely wrong about this, but it seems my memory, because I was so blown away by this, my memory was it was like two or three months later. And, uh, my friend Rob, I hope Rob is listening right now. My friend Rob, my guitar tech and best friend, Rob calls me up and says, Hey man, let's go see Warren tonight. I was like, no, no, they got a new singer. They're supposed to be great. I'm like, oh man, come on, Rob. So he drags me down to Hollywood. We lived in Pasadena. Drags me down to Hollywood and we go to Gazzari's. <clears throat> and uh, we go in. I'm standing in front of the soundboard. I knew the the sound guy. He's my friend. And he was running sound for us at the time, too. And place is packed. Packed. And Warrant, instead of coming out and playing their first song, they open up the dressing room door from upstairs. Dressing room doors open and they're stair. And they come down the stairs and they're playing. They're all wireless. Janie's out front. First time I'd seen Janie Lane, I didn't even know who he was. They're coming down and, and they're singing, playing. Stephen Sweet, the drummer. This is my memory. Um, they're, they're, right. And they, they march down and I was like, holy crap, that's, that's amazing. What a great idea. Right. And they come down playing, marching, and then they come out and then click, 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 bam. And the lights kick off and they go and I'm listening to a different band and it was inside of, and I am not joking about this. It was inside of like. 30 seconds. I said, this band is going to be huge. And it was Janie's melodies. It's his songwriting. It's his voice. But he transformed the whole band. They elevated to another level. They had this choreography going on. I thought they, they didn't do that two months prior at, at the Troubadour. No. It was completely transformed and I sat back now this is what I said to Ron earlier 
I back then, and and a lot of musicians were like this. We were all friends and things, but man, you know what? The competition was tough, and you had to be cocky. You had to believe in yourself. You had to, no matter how great you, wh- whoever it was that you were seeing, you had to believe that you were better than these guys. Yeah, it was it was fun, but it was very very competitive. And at that moment, that was one of the very rare times when I stepped back and went, I've got to, I've got to up my game because this is amazing. This is just too much. I ended up seeing warrants. Um, now this was it. This was the beginning. This might've been the first show with Janie Lane. And, uh, I don't, you know, jump on Wikipedia and look at the history of the band and the timelines of things. But, but this is my memory. And I ended up seeing him at the country club, um, uh, saw him at Gazzari's, and I tried to catch them as much as I could because this band had it. Now, my memory was, I don't think they got a record deal for maybe two years, a year, two years. It was a while. And they, they got their stuff polished. By the time they got to the record deal, um, the other clubs in LA were too small for them. And they were always, they seemed like to me, like they were the, the house band at the country club, which was one of the biggest venues there. And, and Ron Keel can tell you all about what it was like playing at the country club, Chuck Landis country club. And they went to the next level and they were head and shoulders above everything else that was going on at the strip. And this is, I'm telling you, this is Guns N' Roses era. This is Poison's era. And, and this stuff that was going, and, and that, was, that was the band that really flipped me out. Guns N' Roses was great. And, and I really dug them. And the Rock City Angels, they were great. And I really dug them. But it was, it was Warrant that really, really flipped me out. And to see them... Uh, go through this transformation. It was incredible. So that's just a memory of the strip. I wanted to share that with all of you. It was, it was, it was just magic. It was just magic. And it's a time and a place that, that is gone. It'll never be back. It was an accident. I would love to see it happen again, but it was an accident. And, uh, you know, what was next was Seattle. And we've seen these things go back and forth between the coast and around the world. Um, uh, different cities around the world that start to influence everything that was out there. But I was there in the strip and it was uh, incredible. It was warrant. And with that, let's take our first break because when I come back, Ron Keel, Ron Keel is here. Steeler Keel. And of course the Ron Keel band is going to help me man the phones tonight. I've got calls on hold. You can start calling in, uh, continue. I should say to call in. 747 228 2051. 747 228 2051. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be back with Ron Keel and we will get to your phone call. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black, Fader Night. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. 
with wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection or a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan small batch roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, folks. It's troubling times and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. GetTheTea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. GetTheTea.com. The tea that makes you go. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. It is Thursday night, Fader night, but not just any Fader night. Tonight, we've got Ron Keel joining us. He's going to help me man the phones, take your phone calls, 747-228-2051. And uh, all the normal conversation that we normally have, but Ron is here. And this is the thing. And and, and looking back uh, to the first time that Ron was on the show with us, and Ron and I talked a couple of times that week, and, and we spent, my memory, we spent hours on the phone talking conspiracy and UFOs, and, and Ron going, so Jimmy, what about, Jimmy, what about, I'm like, how do you know all this stuff, Ron? It was absolutely incredible. It was a great night on the show, and Ron and I were talking last week, and uh, or was it earlier this week, and I said, hey man, let's do another fader night together. He said, Absolutely. I'm off the road. I'm at home. Let's do this. So Ron is joining us uh, tonight. I'm not going to get into uh, the two-hour Ron Keel bio, but I will say from the first Steeler album, Ron Keel's 35-year career has taken him from the concrete jungles of Arena Rock 
to the dirt roads of country music. He has sold millions of records. He has toured the world, both as a heavy metal screamer, uh, his words, not mine, and a southern rock outlaw country artist. And I'm very excited about this. I want to say welcome back to Fade to Black, Ron Keel. How are you tonight? I am fired up to be back on Fade to Black. Thank you, Jimmy, for the invitation. Thank you to your audience for welcoming me, and I hope that everyone enjoys this as much as I plan to. Oh, man, it's going to be great, Ron. It's going to be great. And see, the thing is, um, uh, it, it, you and I talking on the phone, and uh, you know, we have so many mutual friends and things, but you and I are just able to you know, talk music or, or UFOs or guitars uh, uh, it was funny earlier this week, you know, you're telling me about a MIDI acoustic guitar that you have, and then we swing over to UFOs and that's, that's what we can do together, man. And, and I just really appreciate it. So much fun. Well, I appreciate it too, Jimmy. You know, I know we met back in the day in the parking lot of the sunset strip. And by the way, that, uh, opening segment was probably the best description anyone could ever get of what it was like. Back then, back in the day, in the 80s, on the Sunset Strip. But, you know, I met a lot of people back then. I became a Jimmy Church fan when you were guesting on Coast Coast AM. And, and um, I'm a huge fan of what you do. And uh, those radio broadcasts that you've done through the years have kept me company on a lot of long road trips and flights. And <laughs> when you reached out and got in touch with me, we, we did find a lot of common ground. I'm a fan first. I'm a card-carrying, T-shirt-wearing, uh, <laughs> fade or not. I'm a, I'm a premium subscriber, and I am just like the rest of your audience. We're all looking for the truth, and we like talking about it and hopefully uh, uh, jo joining in that search for the truth together. You know, um, and 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 I do want to talk, uh, you know, some rock and roll tonight. And you heard the opening segment, so you know where I'm going to swing this in just a bit. But... Um, you, well, the audience, but Ron, you can see what is behind me, right? I see it. <laughs> and, 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 and that's my world, you know? And, and yes, I'm here every night. My, my passion is, is seeking the truth and, and everything that is unexplained out there. I enjoy it so much, but I need to keep my roots, you know, and that's, that is what is behind me. And it is just absolutely bizarro to me that you and I are like identical brothers, man. It's just, it is just, it, it's funny. I think it's just amazingly great. Well, I think it's fantastic. And you have been, uh, as a broadcaster myself, hosting my own radio show syndicated for 12 years, plus spending a few years on live daily terrestrial radio. I take a lot of cues from my heroes, and you're one of them. And so I, I've I've uh, I've ripped you off many times. Uh, it's it's dark, and Twitter is to my left. <laughs> all, that, all that stuff, man. Uh, Gene Simmons taught me only steal from the best. So I've bought a lot of cool stuff from your game, my friend. Man, I, I think I. You know what? I've I've written a couple of songs that uh, were certainly uh, lifted from you too, as well. So now that we both come clean, right? Okay. Right on. Um. Uh, but our conversation earlier tonight, um, and, and we talked about warrant and, and, and I just went back and relived that memory and, uh, a memory that I could have continued on, you know, because it was just another night on the strip in, in Hollywood. This is the way that it was, but I'm going to throw that question back at you because you had, I, I know that you had difficulty answering it because a, there was a lot of talent on, on the strip back then, but B, at, all of us were very focused on our own careers and our own band. And if you didn't think you were the best, then you didn't have a place on the strip. It just, that's just the way that it was. But Ron, back in the day, was there a band that impressed you? That's a really tough question. I knew you were going to ask me that again once we got on air, Jimmy, but you know, you, we were impressed by a lot of them, but we felt we had something special too. And it's, it's looking back now, I, I have a different perspective, but at the time we were extremely cocky. We walked into every club with a big chip on our shoulder. We were the out of town guys from Nashville trying to take over that LA slash Hollywood scene. So there were bands that I enjoyed seeing, uh, rat black and blue quiet riot, great white 
and so forth. And then there's certain bands, like you mentioned with Warrant, where you knew when you saw them, they were going to be big time. Uh, I think, obviously, Motley Crue comes to mind. Kevin Dubrow was one of those people that when I first saw Kevin, we became good friends later in, in, in through the years and toured together and such. But this was between versions of Quiet Riot. He was fronting a band called Dubrow, basically just his last name. Yep. And I saw him at the Troubadour, very much like you saw Warrant, and I just fell in love with his his charisma, his showmanship, his passion, and not the prettiest boy, you know, on the strip, but boy, he had some heart. And I knew at that point, this is uh, you know, probably a year or two before they put Quiet Riot back together and got their deal, and Metal Health made history. I really believe that Kevin Dubrow was going to uh, was going to be one of those guys that was going to be big time. Another band, uh, Black and Blue, yeah. which is still around to this day. And there's so many bands. We talked about Lillian Axe earlier. You could put Keel uh, in that uh, category of, of never quite achieved what we thought they were going to achieve, right? I mean, we had some dreams come true, and I've had a great run. By the way, i got to correct the bio, man. It's been 40 years now, Jimmy, 40 years <laughs> since the formation of Steeler. And 40 years since I moved to Los Angeles and Hollywood in October of 1981. That's when I went to L.A. So it's been 40 years since my first recording, since the first time I heard myself on the radio. Got to correct the bio, and I'm proud of that status as an elder statesman, uh, as many of us are now. As you mentioned back in the day, it was extremely competitive. We were not buddies. We were not friends. I and mean, some of the bands that did a lot of drugs might have been a little bit friendlier with each other. But man, as far as I recall, it was dog eat dog. Nowadays, it's the survivors, guys like Jack Russell and myself, and so many others that have made it to this age. Uh, we cherish those memories. And when we do a show together now, whether it's Monsters of Rock Cruise or any of these big events, or we, we play on a bill together, it really is like a family reunion because we all remember those doggy dog dog days back on the strip. Yeah, and and it's funny we're going down this list of bands and and forgot to mention Dokken, right? How incredible uh they were and 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 those first few albums uh certainly changed things. And and so then um I wrote down and I was like how did how did Ron and I skip Armored Saint? Odin, right? <laughs> Odin. Well, there's so many. There's so many. Odin. Of them and so Odin. many great bands and so many really good bands. And you know, it, it it's really a combination of factors how one band could could break out big time and, and go multi platinum, and other bands like the ones you just mentioned, Armored Saint, Odin, maybe never achieved that level. Now, of course, Armored Saint's still going strong after all these years. And I remember when they got their record deal, I was pissed. <laughs> and I was like, no, come on, man. Every, we would hear the news around Hollywood. Oh, do you hear so-and-so got signed? Right. And you, you were not rooting for them. You were not happy for them. You go, that's my deal. <laughs> that's you know, right. Every, no, it's everybody so wanted true. the record deal. And we wanted, we wanted more people, more ticket sales, more girls, more parties. We wanted more than the other guys had. So it was very competitive uh, to say the least. Yeah. There were so many bands uh, that were, I mean, the competition was stiff. I was, I was, I was like Shark Island, Shark. You, you know, and they were, they were, they were so good, and probably deserve, but but never got it right. They they and and and, and you know the Odins and the Shark Islands of the world. There was a lot of that at the same time on the Strip, yeah. uh, or you know Perkins Palace and and. And, uh, you know, just bringing up the country club and, hey, oh, okay. So I was, I mentioned country club earlier and this is, I want your take on it because, uh, for me, uh, you know, with the Troubadour and Gazaris and, and of course the Roxy and, and, and the whiskey. And if you went down the street, there was like uh, club lingerie and things like that. But the country club was like the big deal. To me, was it was it the same way for you? Yes, the Country Club and Perkins Palace, both which you mentioned, would would be the best simulation for a band like that to be on an arena stage. And right. you got to realize that all the bands that we're talking about, every one of them, grew up in the arena era, watching bands like Kiss, Alice Cooper, Ted Nugent. We would go to the arenas, and we would try and emulate what those guys were doing 
on the club stages throughout Hollywood. So everywhere you went, as you mentioned, you saw an arena quality show. And I think it gave a lot of those bands a real edge when they did get signed, when they did get their first tour. They walk out on stage in front of 10,000, 15,000 people and they're not scared or intimidated. They've still got a show that's larger than life. Right. So that arena rock generation, uh, you could see that. Every band that you mentioned would go on stage at the Whiskey or the Troubadour, and we would pretend like we were in a sold-out arena. And like Steven Tyler, one of our biggest mentors of that generation, said, fake it till you make it. Close your eyes and pretend like you're singing to 10,000 people every time you get up there. And then it'll be, it, they'll follow that dream, and and that dream will follow you. And you brought up. Uh, I want to circle back uh, to Black and Blue for a second. Um, I, I I went to see Black and Blue as much as I could, you know, and you know Tommy Thayer and Jamie St. James. But um, and I said, wait a minute, who that the the rhythm guitar player? And you went, Jeff Whoop, right? Whoop <laughs> Warner, Whoop <laughs> Warner, what a great guy, and Whoop. Um, uh, he had, I'm going to say everybody loved, uh, whoop and, but it was the way that guy owned the stage. He owned it, man. He owned every show, didn't he? He did. And once again, not the prettiest boy <laughs> no. on the strip, <laughs> no. you know, he was, but he had charisma. He had personality, he had attitude. He did own the stage. I thought the whole band did. If any band out of that era, if I would have said, like you said, with Warrant, those guys are going to be huge. It would have been black and blue. Of course, there are reasons why, and everybody goes, why didn't it happen for you? And how come you never achieved a you know, platinum success or longevity that, that Motley Crue or Rat had? And it's, it's a combination of factors, man. It's not any one thing, but uh, black and blue certainly had it all with the songs, the show, the big money deal from Geffen and the production from Dieter Dirks, who also produced Scorpions. That's those are some great sounding records. Yeah, great sounding records. And uh, I just remember whoop and and people yelling whoop whoop right <laughs> and why and and I I was so fixated on him during a show. So anybody uh, out there listening right now, look these are these are old memories uh, with Ron and I, and I go back to these little segments of my brain. And you know, talking about black and blue, and it 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 it, it focused down for I you know, and, and Tommy was a great friend. I like Tommy a lot. But Me too. I, what a great guy and a great, a great player. Guy. Obviously, a twenty year tenure with Kiss yep. now, and you know, I mean, you try and describe that, and I get it in every interview. What was it like back in the day? Everybody wants to know. I think they should just listen to Jimmy Church's opening <laughs> on tonight's Fade to Black, and you'll get a great description of that. Also, a great book that I just participated in was a New York Times bestseller called Nothing But a Good Time. A big bestselling book with interviews from all the guys who lived through that uh, 80s heyday on the Strip. Highly recommended book, and I was glad to participate in that and lend some of my thoughts to, to that memory as well. Now, um, share with me your thoughts of uh, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night or closing at the Rainbow and uh, and walking out into that parking lot. There, there's got to be something that sticks out for you because it was 365 days a year, uh, total mayhem out there. But does something stick out? Yeah, there were 365 hundred women out there in the parking <laughs> lot and you could just it was a, it was a smorgasbord and we were all very hungry at the time so i mean it was it you know a lot of it was that was posing time you know that was that was time to, to play rock star be a poser i don't think any of us did that when we walked on stage so many great musicians and great bands and great shows but after closing time at the rainbow that was the real rock star time when you got to, it was, it was literally the ultimate meet, greet and eat of all time. <laughs> it, 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 you know, and I, I just think about how, um, how magical it was. I don't know if we collectively really appreciated how magical, uh, those nights were and and what was really going down because for us it was survival it was bands it was music um but what a moment in time that ultimately it would be that the rest of the world was was focused on this but it was just another night of the year and it was it was absolute magic 
It was a magical time and a, a cultural revolution, as you said, that will never be repeated. To be right there in the eye of the storm, like you and I were, were it was a great uh, experience. I'm really glad that I made that move in 1981. Something told me, man, I got to get got to get to L.A. I had a band called Steeler in Nashville that was making a lot of noise. We were the motley crew of Nashville, and we had we had something special. And I said, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna get where we we need to go here in Nashville. It was still country music city. Now Nashville is is Hollywood. I mean, everybody lives in Nashville now. I moved there in 1979, and there was no rock and roll at all. We were an apple tree in a cornfield, so we stuck out. We got attention, we got noticed, and we got ourselves to L.A. and had to start all over and claw our way up through that scene. And um, I'm really proud of those experiences and those times. But people, people, I, I think they kind of romanticize it a little more than I do, because for me, it was really, really difficult. I was uh, young, immature. I was starving. I was trying to learn how to write songs. Uh, we were living off of uh, maybe a quarter of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich each day. Our lives were in danger every time we walked down the street. Uh, in Los Angeles, it was a dangerous time, and we were. I I I I treasure those experiences because they made me who I am. But I wouldn't go back for uh, all the money or platinum in the world, man. I'm really happy where I'm at now, and I'm glad to have survived that storm and come out better for it on the other side. Now, uh, as we head into the break, um, uh, for those I I know you've uh, uh, spoken about this uh, millions of times, but uh, in the beginning, uh, you get here and you've got Steeler, um, and it seemed to me, uh, pretty quickly, um, you, you're introduced to Ingve Malmsteen and you get the record deal. How did that happen? How did, how were you, how did Ingve come into the picture? We had clawed our way up through that scene over the course of two years, 81, 82, when we were beginning in the outlying areas, Pasadena, Orange County, up in the San Fernando Valley, because we couldn't break into Hollywood. Finally, we did break into Hollywood and did big numbers, man. We packed the house at the Whiskey and the Troubadour, and, and we got a lot of airplay. Joe Benson from KLOS started playing us on the local music show. KMET started playing us, and we got a lot of attention and notoriety in the local media. Uh, music Connection Magazine, some some BAM Magazine, you know, those, those publications were big back then. So we were a top draw before anybody ever heard of Ingve. I just felt like in order to get it to the next level, I needed to make some difficult changes. And whether those were the right decisions or not, nobody will ever know. I am still really dear friends with the original members in Steeler. I'll be seeing them in Nashville next week at Rock and Pod, an expo that I'm doing in Nashville, uh, August 6th and 7th. And I've often regretted that move. Now, of course, discovering and being a part of that. I, I found Ingve in uh, a mountain of cassette tapes in Mike Varney's apartment. We, we were listening to every possible guitar player uh, that sent him a demo, and we heard Ingve's demo, and obviously it was uh, very special, and he was doing something that nobody else was doing or could do, and I thought he was uh, one of the best guitar players on the planet, even at the age of 18. And we pulled the trigger right then and there, called him up, and brought him to America to record the Steeler album and be a part of that band for four months, which will live forever in infamy. The uh, the album uh, obviously still stands on its own, um, and and Ingve happened. But then after Steeler um, and you form Keel, you 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 find uh, Mark Ferrari and and. And how did that happen? I mean, how did you go from one great guitarist to the other? That's a pretty well, lucky thing. Keel had a, an amazing, or still has, an amazing twin guitar team, Mark Ferrari and Brian Jay, who did right. all those blistering solos back and forth and the harmonies and all that. Uh, and I've always been really lucky, man. You know, I work hard, and there might be a little talent in there somewhere, but most of it is just plain dime, a dumb blind luck. Uh, I put Keel together... Uh, as Steeler was folding and within three months we were in the studio making our first album and then within four months we were signed to our major label deal with Gene Simmons producing our debut album The Right to Rock so it all happened very quickly 
Uh, it, was a, it was a juggernaut, and obviously it was the right move to disband Steeler and put Keel together. We ended up with three albums that charted in Billboard's Hot 100, some uh, timeless songs and singles like The Right to Rock, Because the Night, Tears of Fire, songs that are still in my show to this day. So we were very fortunate. We are in the right place at the right time, and we worked really hard. We, we were uh, noon to midnight rehearsal. I mean, that was the schedule, noon to midnight. And, and with Brian and Mark, did you just have open auditions, or were they referred? How, how, did, that, how did that connection happen? Man, I, I was looking for a guitar player, and I came home one day, and there were 27 messages from a guy named Mark Ferrari on my phone. <laughs> and I said, I want this guy. You know, he's just obviously somebody with that passion, that determination. We met and, you know, I don't recall auditioning Mark. I think that it was instantaneous. This guy's a rock star and he picked up the guitar and he played a little bit, I'm sure. But it was like, okay, this is, it was, it was, uh, very quick. In fact, Mark Ferrari was there at the last Steeler show when Kurt James was playing guitar for Steeler. Mark Ferrari was at that gig standing side stage because we all knew this is Steeler's last show. Mark had already been become my next guitar hero and uh, the rest is history i'm really really proud of all the the great guitarists that i've been blessed with uh from uh Inve momstein mark ferrari kurt james brian kurt, J. Yeah, uh, yeah so many great players through my country career and now for the last seven years dave cawthorn from the ron keel band it finally he really feels like I've got my Joe Perry, so to speak. I, uh, we've got that uh, synergy on stage together. We've been all over the world from Australia to all across the U.S. together the last couple of years. and uh, it, We've been together seven years now, and he's the lead guitar player in the Ron Keel Band. He's got uh, everything that uh, all those guys had. And I, like I said, I've been very lucky and very blessed to have good people gravitate into my life. And, and I just keep working hard at it. But that luck... Yeah, that's that's uh, something intangible and unexplained. As one of your phenomenon <laughs> it, that surrounds Rod Keel, it's a supernatural, paranormal phenomenon that surrounds me. You know, you just brought up Kurt James, and uh, just like you and I connecting because of the unexplained, right? Um, not because of music, and I th think that's amazing. I get this uh, uh, email. Uh, this is uh, probably uh, three or four years ago. Get this email from this guy. Hey, Jimmy, I just want to let you know, man. I really enjoy the show, and I'm really into UFOs and and the phenomenon, you know. And uh, just just reaching out to you, man, Kurt James. I was like, Kurt James, what? <laughs> it's just just out of the blue. And I wrote him back, and I was like, Is this really you? Um, but, but it's, it, it's just a small world, Ron. It is a really small world. Yes. Thank, thank goodness. The internet has made it smaller so we can connect with each other and all of our fans and listeners and everybody out there who shares the same passions we do. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's take a break right here, Ron, and let's uh, come back and take some paranormal phone calls. Well, they could be music. It might be both country and Western. This is fade to black. I'm yours to be church tonight. Ron Keel is helping me man the phones because it is fader night 747-228-2051 ron and i will be right back after this short break stay with us Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30DaysFree. That's coupon code 
30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. KGRADB.com. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm Katie and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright-Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the lucky pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. It is Thursday night. It is Fader night. Open lines. 747-228-2051. 747-228-2051. Ron Keel is hanging out tonight. And uh, and now, Ron, I'm going to give you the pleasure of saying you're up next on Fade to Black. Who's calling? You're up next on Fade to Black. Who's calling? <laughs> I love it. And uh, we're going to go here. Who's up? Who's up? You're live. You're live on Fade to Black. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> I love it. And uh, Turn me down go. in the background. Turn me down in the background. Yeah. 
turn me down. Hello. Yes, you're you're up first. Ron just said, "Who's up?" This is Mark from Dallas, boys. What do y'all say? <laughs> oh, tonight? Da- Mark from Dallas. Da- Ron Keel, we got the treat. Good evening, Mark from <laughs> Dallas, Texas. My man, two great brothers to have you from on other mothers are on tonight, man. How are y'all doing? Uh, we're doing great, and. Uh, uh, I got to, uh, you know, Ron, Mark, um, and it's a, it's a miracle that he's up first. I don't know how he pulls it off, but uh, Mark's a guitar player out of Dallas. Um, he's also in law enforcement, and uh, but he's got severe musical knowledge. And uh, very strange, Mark, that you're up first tonight with Ron. <laughs> Jesus loves me, brother. I've told you, this is God's will that I came on first. You know how it works. Yeah, right on, Mark. Well, look... <laughs> Ron, man, it's great. I love when you're on. I uh, hope you're doing well. And just so you know, in your honor, I've been listening to Keel all day today to get uh, to get the vibe right. Wow. And, uh, thank you for that. And for, also, thank you for, for your, your knots, service to your community. You treat yourself to some incredible vocal range. Check out Thunder and Lightning and lay down the law, please, when you get <laughs> done listening to the show tonight. Wow. And if you're not moving, baby, something you're you're uh, something's wrong with you because that is some old school rock with some incredible vocals, man. So thanks for all these years uh, of uh, excellent music, man. I uh, thank you. I appreciate you enjoying uh, my work, and uh, you cited some some pretty incredible vocal work on those that late on the Law album. That was the first record where I realized that uh, I, I, maybe I can pull this off. I think maybe I can make records because the first couple of recording sessions didn't go so well. But that one that one stands the test of time. So I appreciate you listening to it today and calling into the show tonight. Hey, Jimmy, I cannot hear him. Oh, you cannot hear Ron? Oh, okay. Hold on I for a second. Ron, huh? Okay, Ron, say hello. Okay. Hello, Jimmy. I was just I was just thanking you for... Uh, listening to my music and uh, compliment, I was complimenting myself on the vocals on that record. That's some pretty crazy screams on that. That late on the Law album from 1984. It was a time when I had to prove to myself and to the world that I could really cut it in the studio and and make good records. And I think that was the first inkling that uh, I got of that. It's it's amazing that now what 37 years later, people like you are still enjoying it, and I appreciate that. You got them now, Mark. No, I can oh. just barely hear, just barely hear him in the background. Okay, background. that is now, that is strange. Uh, Ron, do another check. I, I've never had this problem before. Well, you know, I usually, I'm, I'm a very soft-spoken guy, Jimmy. As you yeah. know, I don't, I don't usually <laughs> talk very loud, so people have a hard time hearing me. Maybe I should hit one of those high screams and see if Mark and Dallas <laughs> can hear me. Just Mark, open your window, and I'm going to let out a scream as if we hear it in Dallas. <laughs> you, you, you got uh, him now. You got him now, right? I could, I could just barely hear him. It's a little better, but I could just, ba- I could barely hear him. But I, I heard he heard him say, "Open the window." <laughs> yeah. Okay. <That> <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, I, I'll dial it in. Uh, it, it's just uh, very strange. Normally, everything is cool, but uh, what do you have? Got you, man. Um, what do you have for us tonight, Mark? Well, you know, man. Uh, obviously, we all come from musical backgrounds, and music means a whole lot to us. Um, I know that when I was a kid coming up, I was listening to the Beatles. Well, my parents listened to. Johnny Cash, Merle Haggard, and Buck Owens. I thought they were uncles of mine. They listened to them all the time. Um, but then I got a hold of the Beatles. And uh, so at this point, I've just been listening to catchy pop country, pop rock. I'm I'm seven, eight, nine years old. And then this guy named Jimi Hendrix came along, right? Right. And um, I found out that there are two kinds of artists and bands. There's Ooh. bands that write songs. And then there's bands that come in and sneak into your, kick your bedroom door down and put you in a headlock. And they say, we're going to the river and you, you're coming with me and I'm in control. And that's what Hendrix did. And there's still music like that, man. That trans, this music transforms you, right? It's not just fun music. It actually makes you feel things. And ever since then, I've been, I've been looking for that type of music. And I was just wondering, when is the first time both of you guys, had that feeling what band did that for you what band what music and, and and even still to this day like i listen to certain tool songs or something like that it's like holy crap 
you know, that was, uh, that was quite an experience. That was more than a song. That was an experience, right? Do y'all have artists like that that you listen to and that makes you feel that way? Ron? Well, hopefully, Mark, you can hear me now. And I had the same upbringing and background as you did. Uh, parents who played a lot of country music on the stereo, you know, Hank Sr., Johnny Cash, uh, and Merle Haggard. And then my sister, who was 10 years older than me, turned me on to the Beatles and the Stones. So I grew up in a house that was really divided between country and rock and roll. I ended up playing jazz and classical music. And, you know, the one, there's a couple of bands, you know, and I, I've, I can list my five favorites, but there's a couple of bands that really uh, have made a huge impact on my life. One of them is the Eagles and the other is Judas Priest. Both yeah. bands, I would buy everything they've ever put out the day they put it out. And I know those, those bands are not similar musically in any way, but both of them kind of really reflect my inner personality. They both resonate heavily within my heart and in my head. This Judas Priest box set that's coming out in October, I'm, it's 500 bucks, man, and I, I can't <laughs> wait to get my hands on it. And the Eagles as well. Uh, that, uh, that band really shaped who I am, and there's not a, not a time when they come on the radio that I'll change the channel or not turn it up. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna. It, it's it's really hard for me to uh, even sway off of that. Uh, the Eagles and Judas Priest, and it, it kind of in the same vein. If I was going to go back and search where I wasn't going to say the Eagles and Judas Priest, I would probably go Jeff Beck and Black Sabbath. Mm. You know, uh, mm -hmm. that that period for me, Ron, yep. 1975, 76, 77, uh, yep. huge influences on me, as was, you mm -hmm. know, the Eagles' volume, greatest hits, right? And uh, and all of that Judas Priest stuff uh, through the 70s. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Ron, that's, that's really well put, well put. Hey, Mark, thank you for the phone call, my friend. Behave and be well. All right, brothers. We'll see y'all, and uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Thank you, Ron, so much. Thank, thank you, Mark. I appreciate you. And uh, that um, we, I want to say this again, Ron. When, when, if you hadn't have said the Eagles and Judas Priest, I probably would have gone there too. There was oh, cool. something. Yeah, there was something about, uh, especially at that age. You know, I'm you know, 10, 11, 12 years old and, and, uh, the, the Eagles greatest hits and listening to witchy woman, right. in whatever that was, 1975, 76 and how eerie it was and how moody, you know, it was. And then you go, um, and Ozzy was cool. He was great. And, and other singers out there were great, but the first time I heard Rob Halford and and what that twin guitar attack and and everything, and I was a huge Black Sabbath fan, but man, and then you know, like Unleashed in the East, right? Oh, yeah. oh man. absolutely, man. Whew. I uh, I I think both of those bands and all the the great body of work that they did really made me musically who I am. Now I love the Beatles and. I'm a sponge. I'll soak up everything. Uh, I, I love all, all styles of music. And I, I wanted to answer his question honestly about whose music still excites me and who do I listen to and when it's go time and whose albums will I buy the, the day they're released. And those are two of them that have stood the test of time. There are a few more scorpions, ACDC. Uh, I'll certainly uh, buy whatever they do. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think that we're all influenced by everything that we hear as musicians and creative people. But as fans, we want the music that takes us back to those special times and those, those memories of our, our, our youth. And you want to relive that. Eagles and, and Priest, to me, have stood that test of time. And their newer music is just as good. The the Long Road Out of Eden album that the Eagles put out. Gosh, it's probably been, what, 13, 14 years ago now. Yeah, but yeah. A great double album. I still listen to that record probably a couple times a month. And so it's not just the greatest hits from the 70s. It's the, the recent work. And by Judas Priest, Firepower, 
uh, just uh, just a great album that I really enjoy listening to. Uh, there was uh, for me um, uh, throughout that whole period, being this heavy metal guy, there were two other bands that in you know around 1980 uh, that that really messed me up, and that was uh, the Cars and the B-52s. <laughs> they, they, they will mess you up. Yeah, yeah. You, let them. you know, and, you know, here I am, uh, you know, in my bedroom, uh, you know, learning Van Halen songs, right? And, and uh, Blizzard of Oz and, and, and whatever. But the B-52s and the Cars were songwriters, right? That's right. And Absolutely. So those songs are, are they're, they're, just, they're, they're hooks and they grab India and they don't let go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go ahead, Ron. Say who who's up next? You're live on Fade to Black. Good evening. You're on Fade to Black. Who's up next? Hey, Jim, can you hear me? We got you. How you doing? My name is Carlos. I'm calling from Florida. Hey, Carlos from Florida. Say hi to hey, Ron Keel. Ron, how Hello, are you, Carlos? Sir? What's on your What's on your mind tonight, Carlos? Uh, okay. First of all. Big fan, been a big fan of yours for years. Um, so it's an honor to finally speak with you. Thank you. The uh, thing I want to talk about, or not talk about, just uh, ask is, uh, what do you think? I'm originally from Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. and I saw, I saw a lot of stuff when I lived down there. Um, haven't seen anything in years, but I've seen UFOs, I've seen USOs, and um, my question, I guess, to you is, what do you think, or what what is your opinion about the Bermuda Triangle? Ah, you're going old school, Carlos. Right on. Yeah, I've, I know. Right? I've been a fan of this. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a fan of all this stuff since I was a kid. When I got into these uh, mysteries of the unknown books from Time Life, and that was like one of the first things I read about was the Bermuda Triangle. And when I lived in Puerto Rico. And I used to hang out in Old San Juan. That's where I actually saw two USOs, uh, two different occasions. And I just remember, like, you know, San Juan is, like, one of the points of the Bermuda Triangle. Mm-hmm. And I know there's a lot of underwater structures that supposedly are underneath uh, the Atlantic Ocean area. Yep. And Puerto Rico being down there. Anyways, Bermuda Triangle. Sorry. Uh, yeah, old. I, re- I remember the book by Charles Berlitz that came out, the Ber- the Bermuda Triangle. I remember seeing the movie at the drive-in, and you know, at, at this point, decades later, it's tough to separate the myth from the facts. But I could tell you for a long time, if I was getting on a plane, I, I want to fly anywhere else but there. And uh, there. I, I believe that uh, you know the sea. I'm 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 an I'm a desert guy. I'm you know I'm an Arizona Arizona born and bred, and uh, I, I I'm not a water guy anyway. But I'd like to think that uh, there is more to to that than, than we know. Uh, pretty much, I don't know, Jimmy. You're the authority on this type of subject. It was a fascinating subject for me, and, and at one time, I absolutely believed that it was hell on earth, and I would not fly across it. I, uh, I just like everybody else. And it's really funny that you just, I'm, I'm watching Ron. He didn't look around or Google. He went straight Charles Berlitz. And, uh, which tells me that, that you were very interested in this. And I remember the book and I couldn't Ron, I'm being very serious. Uh, Egypt was there and, and, uh, chariots of the gods and, but, the Bermuda Triangle grabbed me, right? There was something going on, and it was the ships, and it was the planes, and and uh, what was it, Flight Nineteen out of uh, out of uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, you know, that disappeared, and yeah, um, and that being part of uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the Bermuda Triangle uh, was something that uh, helped me. Uh, further into uh, my life that I'm doing now today. And I still think that there is something to it. There was, Ron, I don't know if you you caught this, but um, in the WikiLeaks email dumps uh, that uh, that came out with uh, John Podesta um, four years ago um, with, um, 
you know, Tom DeLong being mentioned in yeah. these emails. Well, there was another set of emails with John Podesta, uh, with this guy, Bob Fish. And Bob was uh, revealing all of this information to John Podesta in the emails. But there was something that stuck out there for me in these emails. And he says, north of Bermuda, that the United States Navy had honed in on this electromagnetic frequency and they knew exactly when and where these UFOs would enter and exit the water at this point right there and that there was an underwater UFO base. Now, okay, so I'm reading the emails and then I immediately went to the Bermuda Triangle, right? And I just thought maybe... You know, could this be connected to everything else? And could Berlitz actually have been on to something? And is it beyond coincidence? But I found that fascinating, Ron, that after all of these years, we get this U.S. Navy confirmation and where the U.S. Navy knew that something was going on in the Bermuda Triangle. I had no idea about those emails. I have to go back and listen to some previous uh, episodes of Fade to Black and get caught up. But, you know, Jimmy, what really clinched it for me, the belief, when you either believe or don't believe or you're on the fence, was Flight 19. The fact that those five planes went down was, you could maybe explain that away. But the the plane that went looking for them also disappeared without a trace. (laughs) And that was like... (laughs) <laughs> okay, something's happening here, right. and we can't explain it, and it really does sway your sense of belief in that direction, that, that there is something there, and uh, that was the clincher for me. The, the fact that the plane looking for him disappeared was a big factor. Yeah, and uh, and if you go back to Flight 19, we can stay on this for a minute before we get to the next <laughs> call, and and Carlos, thank you uh, for the phone call. Man. Thank you, Ron. Carlos. Thank yes. you so much. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Have a great night. Um, is uh, when you are down um, in Miami, in Fort Lauderdale, in in that area, Bermuda's right there. You can't miss it. You can get on a sailboat, head out. You're going to run into Bermuda. You also know where Florida is, right? It's right in back. You're not going to get lost. And now we're talking about. Uh, Navy pilots on a training mission taking off. They know where the coast is. They know what's up. You don't need your, uh, your compass, right? You know, you know where the sun is, you know, where the coast is, you know, where to turn. You're not going to lose your bearings. You're just not. It's the coast of Florida And, and they got lost. And then they turn around and the rescue plane, which was a seaplane, by the way, mm-hmm. crashes, gone, not recovered. Um, yeah, very strange. So there's a lot of other elements to this and just not Flight 19. It's the other plane that went out, the search mission. It disappears and it's the coast of Florida. I, I just have a hard time uh, wrapping my mind around five pilots getting lost. No, it just doesn't work for me. Well, I have been on the Monsters of Rock cruise nine times, and every time I come home, you know, I feel a, a little a little strange uh, <laughs> after those cruise events, but I'm not sure it's because we're sailing through the Bermuda Triangle or it's just 40 great rock bands out there having a good time <laughs> with 4,000 fans. But, you know, I've been there. I have sailed through it, and uh, you know, it is a compelling mystery, which uh, I guess... If, if your account of the emails is any indication that we may have a solution to that. Let's, uh, let's go to the next caller. I'm, 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 well, you know what? Ron got two. I'm going to say this. I'm high. You're live on fade to black. Who's calling? Yeah, this is Chris. Hey, Chris, where are you calling from? Uh, brother, I'm from down in Orlando, Florida. Uh, speaking of Florida, say hi to Ron Keel. Yes, I will if I run into him. So I had a quick question for you, or, or more of a theory, uh, just something I was thinking of, just finishing up Amy Jacobs' book. You know, she talks about the Russians. Do you think that there's a possibility that that, uh, that Project Mogul was purposely crashed to cover up for the other two discs that were found, where one of them was found in the next town over? Yeah, very controversial. <laughs> and then the other one was found 
a couple of years later. Yeah, yeah. Very controversial uh, closing to Annie Jacobson's book. And Ron, what uh, Chris is talking about is is Roswell and uh, uh, that she, you know, I don't want to, it, it's so controversial, but that it was a Russian aircraft uh, that uh, crashed in Roswell and the cover-up was a flying saucer. It, it, it's it's almost too. I, I like Annie, but when you hear something like that, and you know a lot about Roswell, do you think it could have been a Russian secret project flying over New Mexico? You know, I, I do have the book, and it's been a while since I read it. But you know, I I think anything's possible with given the technology that. All of the superpowers have probably uh, held back, whether it was uh, the Nazis, the the Russians, the Americans, the Chinese. I think the technology has always been ahead of whatever the public perception was that what we had. uh, That's an interesting uh, angle on that. But. I don't know, Jimmy. You're the expert on, on this this subject as well. I I kind of think Roswell was was the real deal, man. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah I, after what I've heard and listened to and and heard you speaking on the radio for so many years, I I I, I tend to to think that the evidence outweighs any of those other theories. I I like the way that you're reticent, right? And and that's only because. The, there's so much out there about Roswell and you absorb it and everything just falls into place. Too many eyewitnesses, too many things and the cover up the day after the, the weather balloon and, and everything that resulted. And when Annie came out with that, well, I like to listen to everything I do just, you know, just sure. like what you just said, I like to listen to everything and, but it wasn't strong enough for me to go, well, you know what? I think Annie's on to something. It was interesting to read, but it's going to have to really be something really, really strong uh, for me to swing off of all of the evidence uh, in in the corner of Roswell. That has been coming out Agreed. since 1947. It's, it's on you, Ron. Uh, I agree 100%. <laughs> and uh, the evidence uh, that that we've seen and heard anyway... And I've been there too. I'm, I'm sure you've been there many yep. times, Jimmy. But uh, uh, without uh, a- actually seeing it or experiencing it, I, I, I do believe the evidence points in that direction. But you know, I, I'm not discounting any positive. As, as you say, I'm reticent. Um, I believe I believe that uh, it was some type of vehicle and you and I have talked about the extraterrestrial versus other theories. I am a proponent of the time travel theory myself. Yep. I believe that some, at least some of our visitors are from the future and they're coming back in time to check on us or to do their experimentation or, or whatever methods or purposes they're, they're here for. I, I am somewhat a proponent of that time travel theory. Now, Maybe some of them are from other dimensions, other planets, but I believe myself personally that uh, some of them are from the future as well. Yeah, I'm right with you on that. Our guest tonight, Ron Keel, helping me man the phones. This is Faded Black. It is Fader Night. We will be right back after this short break with more of your phone calls. 747-228-2051. This is Faded Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. Hey, 
los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than in a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Fader Night with Ron Keel helping me man the phones. 747 228 2051. 747 228 2051. And, uh, and, and Ron, I want to continue the conversation, though, uh, that we had uh, before the break, which is uh, the time travel aspect to this before we get back to the phones. Um, I find that very, very interesting. You know, we have the vast uh, distances that are out there with space and the universe and the Milky Way and how long it would take to travel uh, to get here and, and so forth. That's a whole nother conversation. But time travelers, us from the future, would make a whole lot of sense. What makes you lean on that? You know, it was an interview that I heard on one of my favorite paranormal shows with an author uh, and the book is upstairs. I forget the name of the book or the author right now, and I, I don't, uh, I don't have it in front of me, Jimmy. But it was a, a very compelling set of interviews on several different shows. Yours, I believe, Richard Surrett, uh, who I'm a, a big fan of as well, had the same author on his show, and he presented a pretty compelling argument to that effect. And uh, the the other part of this, have you had your own sighting? You know, you asked me this last time, Jimmy, you put me on the spot and I didn't remember it until I was watching one of my favorite shows, Paranormal Caught on Camera, huh. and they were showing a UFO sighting and it just, all, all of a sudden it was, it, it just rang a bell and took me back to a moment when I was with my wife and kids traveling from Phoenix to Los Angeles 
back in the 80s, and we saw something out the window that looked like a biological kind of organism. Uh, you call it a jellyfish right. type of thing. I'm sure you've seen the same footage that I'm talking about. It, 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 it's an undulating jellyfish kind of thing, and you think maybe it's a weather balloon, but no, that, that's really strange. So I pulled the car over, had a VHS camcorder at the time, and tried to get some footage out the window. But as you know, it's, it's, a, it's like trying to shoot a rattlesnake with a 38, man. It's not as easy as it looks. You, the footage is shaky and blurry. And uh, what, I, what I shot that day did not come out. But we watched this thing all the way to a town on the uh, California-Arizona border called Quartzite. And then we stopped in Quartzite to let the kids go to the bathroom and uh, fuel up. And when I got to Quartzite, the entire town was out in the parking lots looking up at this thing, pointing at it, going, what the heck is that? Uh, and to this day, I can't explain it, but I, I, when I saw that footage on Paranormal Caught on camera, it really triggered that memory of uh, me seeing something that I could not identify, and obviously a huge crowd of people, an entire town, saw the same thing and agreed with me. Now, after spending a lot of nights out in the Arizona desert camping and growing up, we saw a lot of stuff that we couldn't explain. Uh, lights moving in a fashion that uh, conventional aircraft cannot possibly duplicate. We were close to uh, Luke Air Force Base out there, and, and you, you never know, but you're looking at it thinking that this, this is something that we can't explain. It's, 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 it's definitely unidentified as far as I'm concerned. So I, I do believe that I have seen... UFOs, uh, UAPs, things that we couldn't explain that uh, still right now is, is a very vivid memory. And I, I do believe we should all spend more time looking at the sky because they're out there. Um, the nights that I've spent just laying on a sleeping bag on my back in the desert, that's, that's when you're going to see it. I was, uh, <clears throat> uh, speaking of Roswell, I'm, I'm on the... Uh, the freeway between Albuquerque and Roswell. And there's two freeways, one that's going uh, west to east, and and then you head straight down on whatever freeway, the only one that goes straight to Roswell. And so uh, we make that exit, and we pulled over, it's Rita and I, and we're on our way to the Roswell Festival. And so we, there was... Um, and this is what was crazy. There was a uh, a drive in, uh, 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 you know, a 1950s drive in uh, for food, and I thought, oh, right, you know, let's go here because we don't have these in Los Angeles, and and we pulled in and we got all the normal stuff, you know, triple cheeseburgers and yeah. chili fries, and and we both got shakes. And, uh, and then we get back on the freeway and we've got all this food in the car, but now we're driving. And then as Rita goes, oh my God, there's a flying saucer. And I look up and in the clouds right there is a fly. It's a ring of lights, right? And it's just in, it, uh, it's above the clouds and the clouds are like in front of it. And I, I have a heart attack. I'm like, what are the odds of this? Yeah. Right. Roswell. Okay. So at that moment, right there is a rest stop. So, um, as I'm pulling and she free and, and she spills her shake. And now this is all over the floor of the car. And now we do have to, we were going to pull over anyway, because it's flying saw and it's right there. Right, so we pull over into the rest stop, and I get out of the car, and I'm just staring at this thing in the clouds, and nobody's tripping out. And I was just kind of, you know, and I didn't want to make a scene, but up there in the clouds, just just sitting there, is this flying saucer, ring of lights. And uh, so now I've got to help Rita. She gets out. She's looking at it. And uh, we're taking pictures, and I'm, we're cleaning the shake out of the car. And when I come back out, and I'm looking, at it, and this is like for, for 10 minutes. I'm like, but it hasn't moved. And then slowly the clouds um, move. 
it was like a 300 foot tall street light. Wow. And now, so now the fog's moving away, and now I can see. I'm like, why are they building a street light that tall out here on the freeway <laughs> to Roswell? And 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 after the clouds pulled away, and now I can see, you know, the it, it was. I'm not kidding. When I say 300 feet, it was like 100 yards or maybe even taller and tall enough to be in the clouds, right? Or this fog and everything that was rolling through. And, but the the intensity Ron, that we went through for those 10 or 15 minutes, looking at this, the circle of lights up in the clouds and it's Roswell. I was, I was beside myself. You know, I don't doubt that we're being watched by probably more than one set of entities. As I mentioned earlier, uh, extraterrestrials, time travelers from the future. And it's not hubris. It's the fact that we really are a fascinating human. The human race is fascinating. Our, our capacity for both love and passion and hatred and anger and all of the, the biological, emotional, physical, and spiritual aspects of our race I do believe we're special, and I would not be surprised to know that uh, other races or people from other times are observing us for all those reasons. The uh, uh, the attention that you put on this subject, I wanted to go backwards first, but we'll do that after the break. Um, what what do you make of the attention that is happening right now uh, with the media and the UAP task force and the report, the leaked videos and all of the drama that that has been out there for the last few months? I find it fascinating, Jimmy. And of course I followed Lou Elizondo's uh, show, his quest, his uh, agenda, whatever. I know he was on your show recently. I just downloaded that. I'm going to listen to it on the road. When I hit the road next week for our our tour, I've got a ton of Fade to Black episodes downloaded for the plane rides and the road trips because I'll be on tour for the next six weeks. But I find it compelling, interesting, whatever you want to call it, that uh, you've got these two diametrically opposed viewpoints now coming from whether it's Lou Elizondo and that side of the fence where it's a potential threat. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Dr. Stephen Greer, mm-hmm. who will tell us that, no, they're not a threat. They're here to to help us. They're our friends. And uh, I'm, you know, the, the, the common denominator here, Jimmy, is all my life for 60 years now, we've had these manufactured threats. It, when I was a kid growing up, it was the Cold War. All right. The Russians were the enemy. And the only way to survive a nuclear attack is to hide under your desk at school. Right. 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 And we had those drills in school where, OK, the alarm goes off and you have to hide under your desk like that's going to really save you. Right. Right. And then and then, of course, the the threats have continued through the years from uh, communism to terrorism, the war on drugs, COVID-19, all these they're. The, threats. And it seems to me, it just feels like the military industrial complex and the big pharmaceutical companies have to manufacture these threats to stay in business. And I, I, I do not believe they're a threat like, uh, Elizondo and his, his team does potentially, of course, you have to go by the book and say anything that's invading our airspace is a potential threat. But as Dr. Stephen Greer says, if they were a threat, we'd already be gone. You know, so uh, I I tend to, I I really enjoyed and and continue to enjoy Dr. Stephen Greer's work and his his, uh, efforts in this field. Part of that is because I want to stay positive and believe in the future and, and think that everything's going to be great and, and as opposed to we're going to all perish in an alien invasion next week. But I, 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 I have a hard time buying every new threat that comes along. How do you, um, and it, it's, it's, it's interesting that you recognize both sides. 
How do you deal with that? Because you're being pulled, right? It, 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 it's always there, it, it, you know, fear and threat. And then the other side saying no. Um, how do you balance the two? With logic, I think, you know, and, and in life, Jimmy, everything is a potential threat. Every time I get on the motorcycle, every time I drive the RV across the tundra to get to the next gig, every time we, we, we step out our door, we're always threatened by danger. Danger is a part of life. Um, it just seems to me that Stephen Greer uh, has a pretty solid argument in the fact that uh, if if we were being threatened, we would know it. Or wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, don't, I mean, we wouldn't be here. Question. Where do you stand on that? Because that's the dichotomy of the, the entire UFO slash UAP dialogue these days. Is it, uh, are we being threatened or is that threat manufactured so that we will be prepared for a false flag when a fake alien invasion causes us all to cower in fear yeah and and it's it's such a great point and this is this is this is my take i'm just gonna let it fly we as humans ron we're we're born we learn things um we go through our changes five six seven eight nine ten years old and then you're one person, then you're 15, you're another, you're 20, you're another completely different person. You mature, you get smarter, and then, you know, uh, you know, you get into your 30s and 40s. We go through those changes, and, and we're not the same person that we were 20 or 30 years ago. The human race is the same thing. The human race is growing up. And where we are today um, with our understandings of, of consciousness and empathy and, and compassion and love and hate and all of that stuff comes in. But we are different than we were 5,000 years ago. We are different now today than we were just 100 years ago. Where are we going to be in 1,000 years? Are, are we going to be uh, rid of weapons and murder and and war and and think are we going to mature into that of, of course we are and we're on our way to that now and and i think that we realize uh you know how how stupid war uh, you know truly is so if that's the way that i feel et that is a 10,000 years more advanced than us, which is a blip on the radar of, of history and the age of the universe or a million years advanced. They must have evolved past war and, and hate and weapons and divisiveness and racism and, and everything that, that complicates us today. And they would be, uh, may not, they may not even have a body, right? They may just be energy and, and things. But would they be interested in shooting and killing and, and, and ray guns? Right? <laughs> I don't think so. I really, really don't. They know that we're here. Of course, they know that we're here. And, and could there be... Um, uh, a, a species of extraterrestrial intelligence out there, an extra an ETC, an extraterrestrial civilization that is warring, that is full of hate, and that just wants to conquer. Sure, but I don't think that's what the universe is about, or this Milky Way. Otherwise, we would truly know that, and and that's that's my take. I think that. Um, that they have evolved past uh, hate and 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 conquer, and that uh, because I think that I, I base it on us, Ron, and that that's Absolutely. that's my take. I agree with that, and and certainly appreciate you giving your take on your show tonight and at other times. As a fan of 
paranormal talk radio. I I understand, and plus being a broadcaster myself, you can't always take a side. I, our friend George Norrie, often will not tell you what he thinks or believes. He will elicit from the listeners or from whoever he's interviewing what their take is, but he won't always say, this is what I think or this is what I believe. So I really appreciate you sharing that take with us, and I can't agree with you more. Well, and 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 but you're right. So when I have a guest on the show, it's all about the guest. You know, I'm not going to spend, you know, 15 minutes rambling uh, with a guest on, on, on my thoughts and stuff. But when I do go on other shows, I am able to, uh, get my yayas out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and I've got a lot to say. Most of the time it's, it's all bottled in. There's a, there's another interesting point to all of this, Ron. Um, as I have gone through my, my journey, and uh, through thousands of shows and interviews and conversation, but there's all all the research that goes into that too as well. And I have acquired, yeah, sure, a lot of knowledge, but it formulates an opinion. And as you get older, your opinions get more and more solidified, but I've always kept them inside of myself and I don't get a chance to express it uh, that often uh, for good reason. I'm, I'm an interviewer, right? Exactly. But on nights like this, open lines, and uh, then people are going to ask you, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Uh, was, it, was Roswell a Russian aircraft or not? They're going to ask you your take on it. So that's one reason why the open lines are so important and so much fun, and I'm really enjoying being a part of your open lines tonight on fade to black. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we'll get back to that. I'm, I'm, I'm having too much fun talking to you (laughs) and, uh, and so is everybody else. They're, they're, they're listening, but, uh, take me back for a second, um, on your paranormal journey. Was there uh, a, a key, a key point that, that, you know, you hit a fork in the road and, and now you're going down this, uh, conspiracy paranormal road. What happened? You know, I, I, I think we all have that same common motivation is that we, we'd all like to know the truth about the mysteries of the universe and the unexplained. It, uh, it didn't start with any one epiphany for me, but I was raised in an environment that was not too religious, but I had a lot of different influences. My parents were... Uh, not churchgoers, but they had their set of beliefs. And then I had a cousin who was a Buddhist. And then I went to a Catholic school in first grade. And then I, I had friends who were Jewish. And I, I started to see all these different viewpoints and beliefs. So at that point, you start wondering, well, what's the truth? I'd really like to know. You know, we, Of course, the big answer is what happens after we die? Is there life after death? Are we? Is there a heaven or a hell? Are, are we going to live on after this plane? And everybody's got their own set of beliefs, which I find is fascinating. Of course, the Greeks believed in Apollo and Zeus, and you know, whatever. that was their gods. But I think we know now that, that that's probably mythology. Um, and the search for the truth really began to hit home for me when I was exploring the old Indian ruins uh, Pueblos in the Southwest, uh, going back through Native American history as, as a kid, exploring some of these places and starting to ask questions about our human history. And then you get exposed to books like Chariots of the Gods, like which changed all of our lives. I'm sure you and, and everybody else in this, in this f- paranormal field, Chariots of the Gods and, and the Bermuda Triangle and all those books that ask those questions. And I think we all know that we're never really going to know the truth, man. If if we could just look back and see human history from time immemorial, what we you have, know, how the last ten thousand, twenty thousand, or even longer, how 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 those years have played out as opposed to the history that we've all been taught, and questioning authority whether it's the archaeologists or the priests. Right, right. Do they, do they have all the answers? Or maybe there's more to it that, that, 
you know, they're not telling us or they don't know either. Um, and you know, I think that's my biggest question. I, I will welcome what happens when I die, when I die, when it's time to go, whatever happens next, I'll do my best to adapt to that next plane. But I would really love to know the history of the human race. How long have the pyramids have been there? Is Robert Scotch, is, is he correct? Uh, the Sphinx? <laughs> yes. Can you imagine watching a movie of the building of the Sphinx or Gobekli Tepe or any of these mysteries that we are all fascinated by? That, to me, is, I would just love to, to know some of those answers, which we're probably never going to know, but the search and the journey is uh, the best part of the whole deal. Have you been to Chaco Canyon? I have been to Chaco Canyon. I had an amazing day there. I did a video shoot in Albuquerque in 2014, and it was part of the deal. We're going to take an extra couple of days, and we're going to Chaco Canyon. Wow. And the, uh, the, the, the feeling that you get in a place like that, and I didn't even know all of the details or history that I know now. I didn't know that all of the lines were yes. uh, constructed according to the uh, – North, south, uh, east, west, Ax, east, the west, stars. I had no idea. The at constellations, the time. yes. Yeah, and I, I've tried to do as much research as I I could since my visit to Chaco Canyon, just to enhance that memory. Chaco Canyon is one of, and we're blessed, man. It's right here in the United States. But I I look at that, and this is what this is what messes with my head. Yes, it is the alignment, and it's it's not one; it's uh, it's a dozen different uh, temples uh, uh, in that area that all align up uh, with with the seasons and the years and the solstices and things. There's that part, but the other part for me is the stairs, the square windows, yeah. and the architecture that th th that culture didn't have uh, uh, any knowledge of Rome or Greece or Egypt or uh, South America. And, but the construction is, is so similar. And it just makes you wonder how human DNA can come up with these solutions um, independent of each other. And Chaco Canyon is the perfect evidence of that. Absolutely. They didn't even have the wheel. No. Why do they have all those roads? <laughs> I don't know, you know I mean, man. Why do you need all these roads <laughs> I know. if you don't have the wheel? And there's no real evidence of habitation. It's, it's a place in the middle of nowhere that was built for worship, for spiritual and metaphysical purposes. Uh, so it, there's a mystery on top of other mysteries to that place that uh, I, I don't know that we'll ever have the answers, but it's fascinating contemplating them. Yeah, it, it is. And uh, as we head to the break here, um, the, the part for me that you're referring to, they couldn't grow food. Yeah. Everything had to be brought in, and there must have been thousands of people building all of that. We'll be right back. Ron Keel, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Stay with us. Hi everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment? until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. 
Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard. Available at OrangeGuard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, helping me man the phones. Uh, We'll get to the phones in just a second. I know that Ron and I were yapping in the last segment, but uh, 747-228-2051. And if you're on hold, stay right there. You uh, will get to you in just a minute. And and, and so, Ron, check this out. Um, Over in the YouTube chat, uh, uh, David uh, Hatcher Childress has just shown up. In the chat. Wow. Well, okay. no way. Okay. So, My heroes. Hello, uh, David. Well, so I said, um, I said, okay, this is a test. When was the last time we hung out? And, uh, and, and David, you know exactly. I, he says, I can't remember. I've been very busy lately. David, you know exactly. Okay. Give me the last two times. We hung out, and one of them is very, very, very specific, and it involved a motorcycle. So, David, pop that up, and uh, then I'll find out if it's really David Hatcher Childress, because uh, I just got got to know. (laughs) It'd be really cool if it is David uh, hanging out with everybody. I don't want to bum bum everybody out of the chat room that it's not really david it may be 
So I, I, I'll keep looking for your answer, David. You know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, um, Ron, I'll give it to you. Say it. Give me those words. This is fade to black. Who are you? <laughs> You're live. You're live. Yo, you, me? yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is this is Christian again. Um, called you last night, man, uh, from Washington State. Oh, I hey, quick Christian. Question about yes about um. So, have, have you talked to Lula Lazanda by chance about um, uh, UK or the U.S. government EMPs on the on these UFOs? You mean did I talk to Lou today? No, I didn't talk to Lou or today. Just at all, just at all, just at all about it because I feel like that was a pretty interesting thing to find out that we're supposedly. You know, EMPing these things right out of the sky like it's, like yeah. it's nothing. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, Christian. I didn't talk to Lou today, man. And uh, but no, okay. but in general, like, uh, <laughs> no, I've, I've I've never gone into uh, that aspect uh, with Lou. But you've reminded me, and I wrote it down. Okay, to uh, to ask him about this. So the next time uh, I chat with Lou, I will let you know, and then I'll mention it on the show. Okay. Always. Thank you, man. All right. Uh, have a great night. And uh, the um, 747-228-2051. And uh, um, I'm going to continue lining things up here. 747-228-2051. Um, you, you brought up Lou earlier, uh, Ron. The, the community, it, it, it's really strange uh, for me, but you kind of expect this. But uh, the community, uh, a big chunk of it, um, embraced Lou immediately. And then there's the other half that is like holding off and waiting. What What's your take, not necessarily about Lou, but what is your take on uh, the Department of Defense um, suddenly becoming friends of the UFO community. Oh, I Im I immediately embraced Lou as well. I thought, here's a hero. Here's a guy who's taking our side, who's standing up, who bailed on his gig to give us the truth. Right. So I immediately embraced his take on it. But as we always have to do with these topics, we have to keep an open mind and balancing that take with, as I said, Dr. Stephen Greer's take that, uh, it's not a threat. Um, and how much disinformation, Jimmy, have we been fed for the last seven or more decades? How much disinformation has come out? Uh, and how many people have changed their tune? Even, uh, the governor of Arizona, Fife Simon thing, when the, uh, the Arizona lights, uh, occurred, he made a joke out of it with this alien on stage and then turned around years later and said, yeah, I saw it too, man. It was, it was real. So we're always going to have to be cautious of disinformation. We have to keep an open mind. And I did enjoy Lou's television show and especially the footage, the interviews with some of the uh, service personnel that seemed to be absolutely legit and admitting what they had seen. But now I am cautiously uh, pessimistic, I guess, because of my embrace of, of Dr. Stephen Greer's take on the fact that uh, these people are, are potentially, potentially manufacturing a threat that isn't there. Do you, um, uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, a false flag. Let's just go straight there. Sure. And what would be involved in a false flag? Um, and then people have brought up Project Blue Beam. And when they bring up Blue Beam, I don't think that they realize that uh, that was uh, you know that was a part of a science fiction book and. And and things and and that's how that was introduced in the into the community. There wasn't really a a project blue beam on the books with the Department of Defense. Not to say that we couldn't have the technology of projecting stuff up into the clouds, and there were reports of us doing that in Iraq and 
and causing the Iraqi army to lose their minds and and seeing things up in the clouds. Sure, absolutely, and we do have that technology, and uh, we are able to uh, project uh, movies now in our living rooms with with projectors. And if it's that simple for us to have an L- LED projector the size of a cell phone and and watch a high definition movie what could be projected up into the sky all right yeah and and we've all seen Tupac, uh you know uh and ronnie james dio was brought back to life on yep. on stage and so to have these three 3d um holographic images right there um uh and so forth so i i get that but a false flag as the way that uh richard dolan uh, speaks about this. A false flag happens big and instantaneous, and it's now. It's there for shock. A false flag that is spread out over decades with uh, in, a fake uh, alien invasion doesn't have the same impact. You, you, you know what I mean? Absolutely. But usually, man, I, I, I'm treading on dangerous ground here as a entertainer, musician, my comments on your show could be worldwide tomorrow on Blabbermouth. And, you know, Mike <laughs> Tramp, my friend from White Lion, yep. got in the same uh, tub of hot water when he uh, spoke about 9-11 being a false flag. And Mike has, has been uh, very vocal about that. We have talked about it on my radio show as well about 9-11, whether it's Pearl Harbor, uh the USS Cole, a, a number of what could be construed as false flags. It would be an attack, Jimmy, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be some type of attack that they would blame on aliens? It wouldn't necessarily have to be aliens. There's some destruction or some type of attack on U.S. assets, a military base, an aircraft carrier, whatever, that they could... A tribute, yes. On, yes. on a on an alien invasion, they wouldn't necessarily have to project holograms in the air. They could say, "Look, we we've just lost an aircraft carrier because of an alien attack," and everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people would buy in. Man, yeah, and uh, uh, having something that isn't, uh, you know, look the Independence Day scenario right over los angeles or blowing up the white house that is one thing and i think that's what a lot of his picture but a much easier version of that is something that isn't witnessed by anybody which is uh you know a a u.s navy boat or submarine out in the middle of the ocean is suddenly attacked by a tic-tac and the submarine is lost the the ship is sunk and we've got an alien invasion. That's the that is the fake alien invasion that scares me. That would be easy to do. And you yes. bring up a, look. You bring up the best point, and this is it. Just me saying it out loud. I don't want to give anybody a good idea, right? I I don't even like talking about it. It, it reminds me of like a Tom Clancy novel that gets made into a movie. And you see it play out, and you're like, man, you're giving the terrorist a, a, a friggin' playbook, right? Why? I think the terrorists already have the playbook, <laughs> yeah. Jimmy. I think that yeah. uh, the, the threat of whether it's a biological warfare, uh, a pandemic on a scale that you know we just experienced, obviously you with firsthand knowledge of you know having gone through COVID, uh, how. And I'm not saying it was fabricated or planned. I'm not. I'm not making any claims. But those threats are fairly easy to manufacture. Whether it's a, a fake assassination of a president like JFK, or any other false flag that's going to play into the political hands of the the people in power. And I, I'm just a rock and roll singer. I'm just an entertainer. I don't. I don't know, but I can tell you that I don't trust a lot of what I hear and see in mainstream media, and I'm not buying what they're feeding me because if you watch 
left wing news or right wing news, you're going to get two different stories. What one of them's got to be wrong, or both of them got to be wrong. I mean, there's there's no where do we find the truth these days? And uh, I just don't trust. I I do not trust the people in power, whether it's the government, the military industrial complex. Eisenhower warned us about it in that famous speech when he said farewell, and it still rings true today. I uh, I don't trust them, and that doesn't mean that I'm not a loyal patriot and a, and a you know a very thankful for the freedoms that this country has given me and the ability to express myself on shows like this and the ability to to perform and entertain and sing songs about the right to rock. But I have a hard time trusting people that have lied to me repeatedly. How do you, um, <clears throat> how do you use your discernment, uh, when it comes to the media these days? That's, that's a, a great question and a difficult path to go down because I, I am torn. I, I, I am of the old school philosophy that entertainers, athletes, anybody who's got a platform should be free to use that platform like Muhammad Ali did. Uh, Nobody told Muhammad Ali just shut up and box, man. He stood up for what he believed in and he paid the price. Uh, People like Bob Dylan, who sang about what they really felt and believed in. And back then it was a little more uh, accepted to be politically active or spiritually, you know, you could, you could express your beliefs in a way that you can't do in modern society. There are things I've said on your show tonight that I would never say in any other interview or any other public forum, because I am a broadcaster, a radio show host, a singer who people come to me to be entertained. Mm -hmm. They just want to forget about all the crap they, they see and hear every day. And they want to have a good time, put their fist in the air and sing along and, and have fun. And that's really my primary job. But as a citizen of the planet and a citizen of, of the United States, don't I have an obligation to at least support the causes that I believe in or express myself in a way that it does, doesn't hurt anyone else or, or, uh, but we have been vilified and I have been, I've paid the price. I pay, I played a Trump rally last year, man. I paid the price. Um, I played a Ron Paul rally in Tampa, Florida, Back when Ron Paul was being, uh, was nominated or or running for president, I played a Ron Paul rally. Uh, I was there on the Bundy ranch when Mr. Bundy was being harassed by the, the powers that be, Mm -hmm. I was there on the Bundy ranch and interviewed on major media outlets. I performed that day for a party at the Bundy ranch. Because I believed in what he stood for and what he was fighting for, and I wanted to lend my help to the cause. It has cost me, and uh, if that's the price I got to pay, then so be it. I am not as vocal in the media as I would like to be, let's put it that way, because it's just not accepted these days. People... Well, you're you're going to alienate half your audience. And Tommy Lee, he can he can get away with that. Tommy Lee can go on social media and rant and let his feelings out. And if he loses half of his fans, he's already sold fifty million records. I don't have that luxury. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I I feel for. I feel for the, uh, you know, uh, my daughters, right? 25, 26 years old now. And, and their generations moving forward. I, I have such empathy for them because they, and I don't want to sound like the old guy in the room, but they never experienced, uh, the way that, we experienced the sixties and the seventies and the eighties where we had an absolute freedom of thought, freedom of expression and the fight for those freedoms and what we went through, you know, Frank Zappa and Tipper Gore and, and 
Judas Priest and and Twisted Sister and and how they they fought for uh, you know the the compression and the censorship that was coming down on the music industry, the comedy world and everything else. They 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 weren't raised around that, and I have a big problem today, Ron, with um, the PC pressure that is put on all forms of of entertainment and media where suddenly um, it's not cool to be funny about anything. It's not cool to express yourself about anything. It's not cool to say anything about anything ever, and we have to run in this vanilla road. I, 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 I'm, I'm just so, and I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm going to be Archie Bunker, um, you know, to take it to the extreme, but if you think about, you know, Richard Pryor or Don Rickles or even Eddie Murphy or, or the things that were so, George Carlin, George Carlin, <laughs> Mel Brooks, right. Yeah. And, 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 and the joy that we had in life of not worrying about censoring yourself. And and I'm 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 really I'm really worried about what what it is what is it going to be like in 50 years? I'm going to be gone. You know, but but what is it uh that is going to be missing from freedom of expression and exactly. and the joy and the of truth, laughter, man? And that's what that's what shows like Fade to Black and all the other great shows that uh, you've been a part of, you're all, we're all searching for the truth. And when they censor our ability to take that journey or to search for the truth, then we're in big trouble, man. And uh, the the world has changed. I... Uh, I enjoy platforms like this where you can express yourself on topics that are, you know, you, you, we're not wearing tinfoil hats here, man. We're just looking, we're just looking for answers. You know, we're, we're trying to find the truth, whether it's spiritual, political, uh, medical, whatever. I mean, you've been through, and you know, recently since the last time we spoke, your bout with COVID, has that changed your take on the pandemic or where it came from, why it's here and where it's going? Well, um, and that's interesting that you bring that up because when you were on the show last, that was, um, October of last year. And that was a month before I got COVID and I got COVID on Thanksgiving of uh, 2020 and leading up to that, because I take a lot of supplements and vitamins and things, and and I'm drinking teas, and and I hadn't been sick in ten years. You know, I mean, I haven't had a cold, yeah. and and I, I I'm feeling pretty invincible, and you know, keep my immune system up. Well, um, uh, and it's not a matter of of uh, vaccines or, 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 or going down that conspiracy road, uh, you know, to do or not, you know, to be or not to be. It's not about any of that. But when um, uh, my freedoms in Los Angeles, uh, when, when Newsom, you know, did the lockdown and stuff, and I had to get, uh, there were things going on in L.A., and I got a Homeland Security letter from Premier Radio uh, so I could go, uh, you know, to coast to coast and, and, wow. uh, you know, because we had, we had the lockdowns and things and, and that was really pretty freaky for me and, and to go to the coast offices, you know, it's a multi-floor building, you know, the building, um, right there on Ventura Boulevard mm -hmm. and, uh, um, to be the only one there and all of these signs and biohazards and the requirements and mask and, and what was going on there. Um, and there were employees that were uh, engineers for the show that had gotten COVID and it was a skeleton crew, literally. Um, and so going through all of that and then suddenly getting COVID and what I didn't want to do was uh, before I got COVID 
was discuss any of this stuff on the air, Ron, because I didn't want to divide the audience. I also didn't know what was true. I, there are all of these conspiracy theories going around, and I don't know, and I don't want to project uh, or say the wrong things. And and I and I had to be very cautious. And suddenly, I found myself censoring myself. Then I got COVID, and I got sick. And to have it hit me, hit my daughter, hit my wife, um, uh, uh, members of my family, and in a matter of uh, just a few days, seven, eight, nine, ten of us all go down at the same time. And some of us are in the hospital. And, and I, after about a week, I decided to go on the air and I told everybody what happened. I got COVID. And um, this is what flipped me out. I don't want, to this day, I don't want anybody to get it and then give it to somebody that they love. You don't want to experience what I experience. You know, seeing a family member suffer, right? Because I've got it and now it's being spread and, and, and things. That was the waking up for me, was the pain that I was going through and the questions of, am I going to live? Um and, and then turning around and giving it to somebody that you love. I didn't want any of my audience to, to go through that. And I could only share my experience. So that's what really changed me is that, um, uh, I don't know what it's going to take for people not to infect others or to get infected. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, vaccines or not, or just socially distancing, staying at home. I don't know. Or do we just ride this out? Do we ride this out like flu every single year? And then, you know, we, the flu comes through every year and you either get a flu vaccine or you don't. And then we just go through it every year. Is it going to be like this uh, for, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, it was, a and, and I don't think the authorities know either, Jimmy, that's the problem is that they're claiming to have all the answers and they don't just like you don't, you've been through it. Uh, I certainly don't want to go through it and I don't want to bring it home to my wife and, and, and I have, uh, I've had a difficult time addressing that topic i did a film which has just been now released to syndication it's on the airplanes it's a it's a big deal it's it's a time capsule of what the entertainment industry went through in 2020 it's called uh it was called let the music play and now it's called um when the bands stopped playing right it's a documentary film with right. uh, me jeff pilson from foreigner and Dawkin, michael sweet from striper we all are interviewed in the film and, and giving our takes on that. It's a very difficult decision for me to continue to be on the road. And I'm leaving Tuesday, man. I'm gone for six weeks. I'm leaving on the road Tuesday as we experience what the media is telling us is another spike and there's more, more danger now than there has been what the last six months I did the Sturgis rally last year with 250,000 people uh, there. And, and I did uh, literally, you know, a lot of shows last year during the pandemic. And I've got, uh, I've got a friend who, whose father passed away of, of COVID. And I, I get the blame for that because I'm a super spreader, very difficult for me to bear that guilt. And I, I have a hard time wrestling with these decisions, but as I mentioned earlier, and I don't want to preach, but man, life is dangerous. Every, everything we do, every step we take could be our last. Every day could be our last. We're all on a one-day contract. I, I just want to live my life while I can. Um, I know that uh, I, I don't want to get into the vaccine debate either, but I applaud you for your stance and for uh, – for that statement that you just made. And I'm glad that you and your family are okay. Let's uh, take a break. Ron, stay right there. We got one segment left. Ron's going to be doing overtime. He doesn't have a choice. And if you're on hold, stay <laughs> right there. This is fade to black. I'm your host, Jimmy church tonight. Fader night open lines all night long, but Ron Keel is here. 
and I like to talk. So we will continue all of this after this short break. This is Fade to Black in the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Stay with us. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right, one year. And as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. And, uh, yeah, I will chop, chop. I will chop, chop in a second. It's my favorite thing to do. And uh, uh, Ron, over in uh, uh, the YouTube chat room, right? Um, uh, I have the power to chop, chop. And it's it's funny, man. It's it's. I have a requirement. It's called respect. And uh, and if 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 anybody just a little bit steps out of bounds, it's like it's like the NFL, right? They do the replay. Dude makes a touchdown, and they go and like the the thread of his 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 cleat is out of bounds it's no touchdown <laughs> right but it was good catch that's where i'm at i will chop chop somebody in a second 
Uh oh. What what happened? Was it David Lee David Hatcher Childress? No, I haven't I haven't I haven't <laughs> chopped him yet. Um his imitation game, he's he's trying to ride this out. So uh, uh I'll I'll let him have his fun. But uh uh no, it's just fun. It, it's if it's just if it just leans that way, you know what? No, nah, man, not here. And I have that power. It's well, great. Well, I, I appreciate that, Jimmy. And I'm sorry if I rattled any cages. I didn't mean to oh, go no, off on no. a rant on the COVID thing. I, no. my, my basic question was, was it planned or was it just an, a natural accident that happened? I mean, it is, is, it, is it orchestrated or not? It seems like it was scripted to me. Now, um, uh, I want to talk about you on the road. Um, things are opening up, and uh, as far as the world goes in 2020, it, it, I think uh, for all of us to see, it wasn't just right the cruise ships. It was sports. It was NASCAR, the NFL, and and tennis, and 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 then all music venues all bands and then it's not just the bands it's the sound companies it's the vendors it's it's the merchandising it's the facilities the communities that are around it when when you when you crush all of that it's everybody's lifestyle and family that is affected it just goes from the top to the bottom doesn't it and the schools, Jimmy, the schools, how will this affect our children in the years to come? The COVID pandemic and the shutdown, lockdown and the shutting down of schools and so forth. How will our children remember these times and adapt and hopefully build a better future for all of us? Now, um, I went, uh, I went uh, to Laughlin, Nevada for the UFO Megacon uh, last month and uh, uh, Nevada was already uh, a month open, right? California was yeah. still shut down at that time. But uh, so I get out there and I walked into the casino to see, you know, two, three, four, five thousand people without mask, which includes all the workers and, and the hotel staff. And it took me about a minute to adapt, right? I was like, whoo, this. It's time to party, right? And it was it was great. It was amazing, but for you, uh, the the fans to to finally get out and to see live music, they must be losing their minds in appreciation. It is a great year for ticket sales, live performances, tour dates, and so forth. And obviously, you open the floodgates; everybody's going to come in, right? Um, we did the same thing last year. We did our first show during the pandemic on June 19th at a bike event in Sioux City, Iowa. Went on to play the Sturgis Rally, shows in Minnesota, Missouri, and so forth. Here in the Midwest, it was never as extreme as it was on the, the coast. East Coast or the West Coast. Right. We still had some semblance of, of normalcy here in South Dakota, where I live. Uh, my hometown is Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We never shut down. We never had a mask mandate. And my gym has never been closed. And I've never had to wear a mask to the gym. Uh, and I have not stopped going to the gym every day or at least every other day since the pandemic started. But a lot of the shows that we're doing this year were postponements from last year. And we're all making up for lost time. A lot of people are releasing new records. There are a lot of great new albums coming out because nobody had anything else to do during the pandemic but create great new music. I've got Jack Blades from Night Ranger on my show this week, and their new album is fantastic. And he talks about how they created that during the pandemic. Uh, but it is great to have it back. But we're all, I think, walking on eggshells, wondering when. The Delta variant may shut us down. Uh, do I, I'm leaving Tuesday for six weeks. Am I going to have cancellations? Am I going to have, because uh, when you're out there on the road and you're paying your crew, and, and of course, the, like you mentioned, the, the crew and the support staff is really uh, the people that are most affected by this because they don't get royalties. <laughs> they just get paid for the gigs. Um, 
are we going to get shut down again? I think that's everybody's fear and trepidation. I know that uh, the the Yankees Red Sox game last weekend was canceled. Uh, Foo Fighters canceled a concert at the LA Forum because of one of their team members tested positive or had been exposed. Brett Michaels has just canceled his first show uh, because of COVID. So we are all still walking on eggshells trying to make the best of a bad situation. Yeah, yeah, we can't, we can't, uh, th- there's one thing that is obvious. We can't go and turn this into a two or three year thing. We, we can't, we can't do that. There's, there's got to be uh, a, a solution. I have no idea. Do you remember how big of a deal it was to have a snow day at school? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, to, to get a snow day to shut down the schools, um, it had to be forty below zero. Right. <laughs> it yeah. Had to be something <laughs> like the most extreme, extreme of the extremes. And uh, but to have a, a snow year, right? That's 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 crazy to me. I I, I don't know what it's going to do to uh, you know an entire generation if. If this rolls over into a second year, it will, it will linger. Uh, the, those big red letter days in my life, the, the assassination of JFK, 9-11 changed everything. The one day changed everything. COVID-19, that was a year. That year will change everything for the rest of our lives and our children's lives. And we can only hope that you know, there, there is hope, uh, our light at the end of the tunnel. I've seen a lot of, uh, commentary this past week on the, uh, Jeff Bezos flight into space on his flying penis. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) and I personally literally, and looking back on the, the anniversary of the moon landing, I think we all thought, and I was there watching the moon landing in a hotel room in July of 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, we all thought and believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that we'd keep going back. We'd have bases on the moon within 10, 20 years. We'd be at Mars by now. We would spread our wings and fly to the final frontier, and it really hasn't happened it's happening now because of these uh, private companies that are getting us back into space. I don't care how they're doing it or whose money they're spending. Get us back into space. Get us out there. Spread the human race throughout uh, you know, the moon bases, Mars, the asteroid belt, and beyond. And I think uh, that, to me, I, th- I think it's a huge positive. Everybody's giving uh, the Amazon guy <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of grief. But, man, he is pushing the envelope, and somebody's got to do it. Man, it was pretty cool watching uh, watching that and watching it, uh, the capsule land in Texas. That was, I, I really enjoyed that. And, and, and even Richard Branson and what's going on, certainly uh, also what Elon Musk um, has got planned. And, and I tie all of this into, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this big picture of everything else that is going on, uh, you know, perseverance and, and what is happening on Mars. I have this funny feeling that we're going to get an announcement from NASA. Do you think that, uh, there's going to be life on Mars announced? Great question. And I would not be surprised by that, but I think they already know a lot more than they're telling us. Mm Mm-hmm. I expect the the one thing that NASA needs to have happen is they've got to find life. If they find life, the funding and the effort that is going to be pumped into NASA is going to be extra, just beyond measure. And, and they need to find it. I think they are in pursuit of it. Uh, do they know more than they're leading on? Of course they do. But uh, NASA needs that. 
And the human race needs that, Jimmy. I think the yes. human race needs to explore, needs to expand. We need to keep pushing those boundaries and goals uh, that uh, even JFK set for us in his legendary speech. Uh, we have to expand our horizons and shoot for the final frontier. That's the human nature. And it's 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 more than... Oh, well, we, we have problems we can take care of here on Earth. Well, if it weren't for the space exploration, the satellites and all that, we couldn't be on Skype right now or satellite phones and all of the, the wonderful technology that we enjoy is in large part due to our space exploration program. We've got to continue to push that envelope. And if you had told me in 69 when I was watching the moon landing that we wouldn't have a moon base in 2021, I would have told you you were crazy. Well, the there was there was something about that period where anything seemed possible, right? <laughs> yeah, it was moon bases, but um, it seemed like everybody was behind it, everybody, and that we were not going to stop ever. And then suddenly, Apollo. St- you know, there there's going to be no Apollo 18, right? What do, what do you mean there's going to be no Apollo 18 and 19 and 20? This is supposed to be going on forever, and and I I thought that that was the that was my mood, right? And I thought that every how is it possible that our government can just pull the plug on on all of that and the space and shuttle why is that jimmy what is there a conspiracy theory that that fits that mold that uh there's a reason we haven't gone back that uh, or or is it the secret space program i don't know how you feel about that but are, do we already have bases on the moon and on mars i don't know i wouldn't put it past them man i mean i i uh am uh like i said i keep an open mind but there's a reason we haven't gone back there's a reason for it. It's not money, and it's not uh, the political agenda. There's a reason why they're not telling us what's going on in space, whether it's the next battleground or that the secret space force has already placed bases on the moon, Mars, and maybe beyond. Yeah, and 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 I'll tell you why. We Apollo, for me seemed pretty figured out, right? It seemed to be pretty easy. Now we're putting cars on the moon, right? We're, we're just cruising there all the time and, 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 and projects. It seemed pretty easy. It didn't seem like it was a big effort. Like it was that big of a deal. We figured it out. We were now interplanetary and it, it didn't seem complex, and and the expense, the research and development was was already done. We figured it out. Why would we just pull the plug? I'll tell you this, and that was the confusing part because it was just it, we were driving cars on the moon, right? Yep. I mean, that's right. And and um, but the space shuttle only to be in low Earth orbit. I never really bought into that. If you think about, uh, and this is what I'm saying, Ron, the uh, the the command module, right, and and what it was going to the moon and back, and then you looked at the space shuttle. Which one do you want to fly to the moon in? <laughs> Good point. Right, you want to fly to the moon in that space shuttle, which is like a Winnebago compared exactly. to right compared to you've got an RV. You told me your RV story about Absolutely, the flat tire. Man. That's yes. one of the best. You want, you want, you want the comfort and <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, that uh, that's a great uh, analogy. Why wouldn't we go back? There's got to be a reason. I mean, don't you think looking at the space shuttle that that was designed to fly to the moon and back in comfort? You know, the command module. You know, that's like a VW Bug compared to right i'm not kidding it's like a yugo compared to the sophistication of the space shuttle now but here's the trip on that we would never know right citizens of the earth 
We don't know what's going on up there. We have no idea. We're not there, right? We don't know. And I, I wrestled with this argument for a long time, thinking that, well, the government can't keep a secret. Of course, Monica Lewinsky, come on. But they kept uh, the atomic bomb a secret until they dropped it. So anything's possible. The uh, the question of uh, uh, secrecy, um, and uh, which which takes me back to the UFO subject, when um, when the subject comes up, well, you know they can't. Uh, you know why haven't we had a whistleblower step forward? Why haven't you know what the the Manhattan Project? which involved hundreds of thousands of people, cities in this country were committed to that, right? Mm-hmm. Got cities, not, not, a, not a building, but we're talking about a huge amount of people on complete lockdown, complete. And there are uh, the X-37B, the X-37B, it's probably up there flying right now doing two-year missions in space. There ain't anybody from that program talking about it. We don't know nothing. Nothing. It's on complete lockdown. So is there a secret space program? Well, we know about the X-37B. We don't know what it's doing. We don't. It's on complete lockdown, and that X-37B has to have thousands of engineers designers, uh, flight systems, logistics, design, flight plans, crude, and nobody knows. Nobody's talking. So don't tell me that we don't. We do have a secret space program, and that's only the part that they've kind of let us know about, Ron. Exactly, Jimmy, and I'm sure in your radio career, you've had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I've signed I've a had few. to sign a number of them yes. myself. <laughs> yes. And when I was doing terrestrial radio, and there are still six years of my life that I can't talk about because of an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. When I was doing terrestrial radio, and the station was the number one rated rock station in the market. I was the number one voice on the number one rock station in this market. I would have to tell my listeners what the boss told me to tell them. If I didn't, I would be fired. And if I told them that I lied, I would be sued because of violating my NDA. So when it came time to do the weather, I had to, here's what you say. There's a slight chance of showers in scattered regions uh, across... No, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be a, a, a thunderstorm, man. It's gonna, it's gonna rain out. But I couldn't say that because <laughs> of what the the boss upstairs was telling me. This is the weather you're going to read today, and I would say, oh, scattered chance of some showers throughout the region or some spin on like that because that's what the boss is telling you. I guarantee you every. Uh, Announcer on Fox, NBC, ABC, it's CNN, all of these mainstream media networks is doing the exact same thing I was doing when I had to falsify the weather. They are saying whatever the boss tells them to say, or they're going to lose their job and they're going to be out of work and it's just not worth it. Just tow, tow the company line, go along to get along. If you have a job that is especially in the military giving you the, that that benefit uh your your salary your retirement your pension you're not going to risk that you're not going to risk your family's future and history just to come clean and and tell the truth i get that cuz i've done the same thing and i still can't talk about that's the most i can talk about my 6 years uh during that time so if i was having to deal with that how uh, every everybody in the media is dealing with that, except alternative media like Fade to Black, Coast to Coast AM, and all these other programs like yours that are really looking for the truth. Now, what do you make of, and we just have a couple minutes left, and you know what? I'm just going to uh, uh, say this to everybody that's on hold. 
Um, I'm having too much fun, and we're going to run credits in a second, so I apologize. But uh, I'm really uh, sorry. I, I really wanted to take more phone calls, I, and I, I, I just can't I, shut up. I, I can't and, shut I up either. The discussion, Jimmy. I, I'm sorry. I can't shut up either. Is is this? We had for nearly three and a half years this mass media coverage on UFOs. The UAP task force report comes out on June 25th last month, uh, about a month ago, and it suddenly has stopped. There isn't the UFO coverage, UAP coverage anymore. What 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 do you think is up with that? I'm 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 noticing, and I know that the UFO community uh, sooner or later is going to say what's up. It's a pacifier, and I'm sure you've read the entire report countless times, Jimmy, and I read it when it came out as well, and I found a number of alarming bullet points, uh, mainly to do with the threat, the fact that this is a potential threat to, to our national security, and that was, to me, alarming as well as I had just watched the latest Stephen Greer movie, and, and I'll keep going back to that, uh, I think they've just given us uh, a little pacifier to, I don't, I don't know that the mainstream audience has read that to the extent that you and other people in your business have, have read it. So uh, I don't know what's next, but there is some alarming stuff in there. If you read between the lines and you see some of those implicated threats, they could lay the groundwork for what comes next. I'm, I'm just surprised, you know, uh, you know, Tucker and CNN and BBC and MSNBC and, you know, the New York times and the post and the examiner and, and all of this mainstream coverage has stopped. It has just stopped. And, and I don't know why. And I hope uh, that it wasn't a pacifier. But it's like a Pandora's box, right? Yeah. It, uh, I, feel, I feel funky. I feel funky. Where it was just this extraordinary buildup. We get the report. Crickets. It's crickets. I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully there's going to be something big soon. Well... If we we keep hoping for the truth and keep searching for it, uh, like I said, I don't trust the mainstream media or the powers that be to give us the truth. We have to turn to shows like yours and fade to black to keep uh, keep that search alive and and keep looking for the answers that really are going to have an impact on all of our lives from now on and and our children's lives and uh, for future generations because. Uh, it is uh, it, it, it is historical to say the least. Now, Ron, uh, you're heading out on tour. Um, where can everybody go and get all of the tour dates and information, and of course, your podcast? Ronkeel.com, your one stop shop for everything that I do. Please visit Ronkeel.com. The tour dates start on Wednesday next week in uh, South Carolina. I've got the South Carolina tour. Uh, I've got uh, Chicago for the first time in a long time. I'm back in Chicago uh, next month. Uh, Ohio, Indiana, Nashville, Tennessee at the Rock and Pod Expo. And I think I have nine states on the agenda over the next uh, four to six weeks. And I would love for uh, you to come out and see me at uh, any of these shows or events. Find me online at ronkeel.com. Ron Keel. You are the absolute very best, my friend. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your night, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jimmy. You. I appreciate your your invitation, and thanks for the audience for putting up with me. You, you know you're wearing the same headphones I've got. Look. You, the you task like cams, baby. Uh, task cams. That's, that's what I'm Hello. talking about. I'll talk to you, Ron. Have a great night. Thank All you right, so much. Thanks. Ron Keel. Ronkeel.com. He's heading out on tour next Wednesday. All of the dates, everything, and his podcast are over at ronkeel.com. An extraordinary night tonight, and, you know, everybody that was left on hold, I was just having a good time, and so was Ron. Faded Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announces are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. 
intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2021 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I got a weekend off, sort of, but I'll be back on Monday with Travis Walton. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. It's time to fade to black.